And it once again in Jesus' name. Tonight, our ministers from various blocks of Christian Association of Nigeria are back with us. Would you welcome them? Deep alive welcome. We well, welcome our ministers in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will make us one. One in spirit. One in the world. One with Christ. That we together, as a whole church, will drive the, ch the, the chariot of the gospel and will reach every community in Jesus' name. Together, we're strong. Separated, we're weak. We will not be weak in Jesus' name. Tonight, the word of God is coming to us. I will receive. I'll be made stronger and a better minister in Jesus' name. Give me a good church. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for your people. For your servants, I thank you, Lord, because your hand is upon everyone and your spirit is upon us. We're asking, oh Lord, you empower your people to do exploits for you in Jesus' name. In these last days that we have raised us up, we're asking, oh Lord, we will not fail, we will not faint, we will not falter, we will not be weak, we will be strong in the Lord. For the work you have committed to our hands in Jesus' name, strengthen the whole church to take the whole world, to, to the whole world. And so many will come to know the Lord through our efforts together in Jesus' name. Speak, Lord, for your servants are hearing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 3. And I read some selected verses of that chapter. Let's look at it from verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. The apostle Peter was telling the people he wrote to, members of the church, members of the body of Christ in various locations. He said, I wrote to you before, and I'm writing again. And there is a purpose for that, is to stir up your pure minds. A mind can be pure, a heart can be pure, a life can be pure, and yet dull. And yet weak, and yet lukewarm. And it says, I know you are purified, I know you are purged with the blood of the Lamb, but now I'm writing to you so that I stir up your pure minds. And it says, By way of remembrance, it's not everything I say you were saying that will be new to you, but I need to remind you so that. Your peaceful mind, your pure mind, your empowered mind will be stirred up. And was going to talk particularly, look at verse 10, on the day of the Lord. It says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come. It says, let there be no doubt. Scoffers may scoff, scorners may scorn. Free thinkers may think, anyone can say whatever, but I want to assure you by the Spirit of the Lord that the day of the Lord will come. And yet it says it will come suddenly as a thief in the night. It will come unnoticed as a thief in the night. It, that day will come to separate when a thief comes in the night, he takes something precious away and then leaves the other things that are useless, unimportant, and that day is coming. It's going to be a day of separation 
when that day comes and it comes as a thief in the night the precious people of God are taken away and then that means we are taken away to heaven before that time in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up if that is happening if that is going to happen and if the day is fast drawing near and that day is going to come and the majority of the people on earth will not be prepared how do we get ready so that we escape that day it tells us in verse 11 seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness then he says we're looking for something in verse 12 looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of god we're looking for and we're hastening towards the coming of the day of god it says in verse 13 nevertheless we are according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth we're looking for a place better than this place we're in we're looking for a kingdom better than this kingdom we're in now he says we're looking for that glorious time in new heaven and in new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness it says in verse 14 wherefore beloved seeing ye look for such things is saying that every one of us should be in a state of preparedness in a state of readiness because we are all men and women boys and girls all believers all ministers we're all looking for that day and it says we need to be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless tonight we're looking at the message the believers daily anticipation for Christ's return the believers daily anticipation for Christ's return is saying we need to be ready thank God I will be ready you'll be ready in Jesus name three things we're looking at in the message number one a real examination of the day of the Lord will you hear that phrase day of the Lord what does it mean what does the Bible say about the day of the Lord a real examination of the day of the Lord point number two a ready escape through the de through dedication to the Lord a ready escape all the things that will happen the things that are not meant to happen to the believer or to the church of the pe people of God how do we have a ready escape it is through dedication to the Lord point number three a righteous example for all disciples of the Lord a righteous example for all disciples of the Lord we're coming back to number one a real examination of the day of the Lord let's come back to second Peter chapter 3 it tells us in verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up as the apostle reveals this by the spirit of god it says don't be surprised you will meet ignorant people and you will meet people that are deliberately willfully and deliberately intentionally ignorant 
and they will scoff at the day of the Lord. It says the reason they do that, number one, they forget history. Number two, they forget the signs that the Lord had given. And if you look at the times in which you live, you will see the signs. It says, they deliberately close their eyes to those signs. That's why it says in verse 3, knowing this post, that there shall come in the last days, in the last days, there are first days, there are last days. Time long ago, first days, first century, and even at that time, the last days began. And now, when in the last minutes of the last hours of the last days, it says, knowing this, you must know this, so it doesn't take you by surprise. Knowing this first, the death shall come in the last days, coffers walking after their own lusts. And saying, what is the promise of his coming? They say, where is the promise of his coming? If they asked me, I could have told them, open Matthew, you'll find that. I could have told them, open Mark, you'll see that. They're asking, where is the promise of his coming? I say, have you read Luke? Have you read John? Have you read Acts of the Apostles? When the angel said, this same Jesus that you have seen going to heaven will so come in like manner. But they don't ask people who can give them the right answer. They ask ignorant people like themselves. And when those people say, well, I don't know, they say, there you are. You just believe it, but you don't know. But thank God we know. Thank God I know. Verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Uh -uh, that's not true. And when they tell us that all things continue, we say no, it's not true. As you look at the world, and you look at the proportion of the river to the land, things have changed. As you look at the world, and you look at all the mechanisms and everything we use, the bicycle has come, and the motorcycle has come, and the cars have come, and the trucks have come, and the aeroplanes have come, things have changed. As you look at the world, you're thinking about the warming. That is the heat. It wasn't like this before. Things have changed. But these people, willingly, they're ignorant. And they said, since the beginning of the world, everything continues the same. Not really. Knowledge has increased. Not really. The, you know, various things in the world have turned around. And then it says, for this, the willingly are ignorant of. There's knowledge if they open their eyes. They'll see the change if they open their eyes. They'll hear of volcanoes and tsunamis and all the disturbances on the sea if they open their ears. But they're willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was and is no more, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. A real examination of the day 
of the Lord. This day of the Lord we're talking about, look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. The day of the Lord. Let's examine. Let's read. Let's understand. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Look at verse 17. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. The day we live now is the day of man. And man says, I'm free. I can do whatever I want to do. It's my day. I have a free will. And I have the liberty. I can do whatever. I can live without thinking of God, thinking of salvation, thinking of future, thinking of anything. It is the day of man. But then the day of man will come to an end and God will take over and God will say, this is my day, the day of the Lord. And at that day, only the Lord shall be exalted and the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. When he arises to shake terribly the earth, that's the day of the Lord. When there'll be a shaking, he'll shake the whole earth. It tells us in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, the day of the Lord. A real examination. In Revelation chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. The stars of heaven, not only one star. As you see them, they look tiny. They're very big. And many of them are greater, bigger than the size of the earth. And they begin to fall on that day. And then he says they'll fall as a fig tree casteth our untimely figs when she is shaking of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and every island moves out of their places can you think about that that a whole mountain will move and shift and when you have that you have landslide and many houses of a crush it's the day of wrath and the day of vengeance and the kings of the earth in verse 15 and the great men and the rich men and the chief uh, captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the days and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated in the throne on the throne from the face from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come that's the day of the lord the great day of his wrath has come and you shall be able to stand let's come back to isaiah chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 6, Isaiah chapter 13, a real examination of the day of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 6. Here he tells us in verse 6, concerning the day of the Lord. 
it says in verse 6, How ye cry, scream, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It's not going to be a day of joy, a day of merriment, a day of picnic, a day of little, little things. It's going to be a day of devastation and destruction. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. And do you notice the language? Isaiah, the prophet, is not counting himself as one of the people that will have the sorrow and the pang and the devastation. He says, they shall have. It shall happen unto them. Believers will escape. I will escape. It says, they shall be in pain as a woman that traveleth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy who? Sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven. And the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth. And the moon shall cause her light, shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil. Not only the Israelites, not only one nation. Some people, when they talk about that day of the Lord, they said, you know, it will be terrible for the children of Israel, for the whole world, for the whole world. Verse 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will curse the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden edge wedge of offer. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. That's the day of the Lord. It's going to be a day of judgment. In fact, you come to Joel, Joel, that same prophet that prophesied about the outpouring of the Spirit of God, he also spoke very clearly on the day of the Lord. Joel, I'm looking at chapter 1, verse 15. Joel, chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. Look at chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. You understand now? The day of the Lord is a day of judgment, a day of indignation, a day of wrath. And it says, let them howl, let them lament, let them cry, let them be sorrowful and tremble because the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nice at hand. A day of darkness in verse 2, a day of gloominess in verse 2. A day of clouds in posture, a day of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a stronger, there has not been ever like it, neither shall be any more after it. It says, it will stand out. All the suffering the people had suffered, in all the wars of Israel, all the wars, First World War, Second World War, when you put all the suffering together, 
this day of the Lord, the indignation that will happen. There has never been anything like it before, and even after that time, there will be nothing like it to the years of many generations. Look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter, verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? The strongest of men will collapse. The most courageous of men will crumble under the pressure and the punishment of the coming day, which is called the day of the Lord. Look at verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Sephaniah. Just keep on opening uh, the Old Testament from that uh, Joel. Come to Sephaniah. And I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 7. Sephaniah, chapter 1, verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Let the proud people come down. Let them humble themselves. Let the people who are running after this and running after this slow down because a day is coming that will be unbearable. And it says, For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord has prepared his sacrifice, he has beat his guests, and it shall come to pass in that day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such as are close with strange apparel. Look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lease, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Look at verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. And he stays greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Look at verse 15. That day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Sephaniah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Ye, gather together. O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, and before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, O ye meek of the earth, seek him now, search for him now, touch him now, reconcile with him now, get your sins forgiven now, before that day of doom and destruction comes, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought its judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It will hide you. I said it will hide you. Look at Luke. Chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 25, Luke 21, verse 25, the words of Jesus, 25, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, 
see the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which shall come on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's the day of the Lord. Can we escape? Of course. Can you escape? Of course. What's the provision of the Lord for us to escape? Point number two. A ready escape through dedication to the Lord. We're coming back to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The question is, why then, if we have read and we have heard about the coming day, the day of the Lord, this day when God will bring judgment upon the whole world, why a siege not come? That's, the, uh, that's what the verse is trying to answer now. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. Give me a good amen. It's not willing that any of us will perish. You will not perish. I will not perish. It's not willing that any of our neighbors should perish. They will not perish if we go to them and we tell them about the Savior. About God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, will not perish, but have everlasting life. The gift of life. And the gift of salvation is now available. Go tell everybody, everyone you love, everyone you meet, everyone you have compassion for, go and tell them. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That escape is not automatic. There must be repentance that all should come to repentance. Look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved when the day of the Lord comes. Seeing then that all the things of the world, the houses in the world, and all the possessions of the world, and all the certificates of the world, and all the property of the world, that day of the Lord will dissolve everything. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all Holy conversation, holy conduct, holy character, holy behavior, and godliness. It says, looking for, in verse 12, and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, when in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements of the property in here, it says, they shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And if righteousness dwells in you, and you dwell in righteousness, that day you will escape. In verse 14, wherefore? Beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent. We're not going to be careless. We're not going to say, well, whatever will happen, will happen. If God wants me saved, he will save me. If God wants my family to be saved, he will save them. God can always save anybody. He says, don't act like that. That will be an attitude of being careless and that will be gambling with your life eternal you will not gamble with your life i was waiting for a good amen, amen. wherefore beloved seen ye look for such things be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless do you know that when you are saved, you occupy 
a special place in the heart of the Almighty God that he will take his Noah and the children out and hide them in the ark before the deluge of flood and the rain will come. When you are precious to the Lord, he will take his Lord and the daughters that are ready, he'll take them out before the fire comes upon Sodoma and Gomorrah. Because sick people, righteous people, sanctified people, holy people, are special in the sight of God. Psalm 4, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 4. Verses 3 and 4. But know, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. He has repented. He has believed in the Lord. By grace he has become godly. And the Lord sets him apart not for the day of destruction or damnation. The Lord sets him apart not for the overwhelming of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. The Lord sets him apart, not for judgment and punishment. He sets him that is godly apart for himself. He'll set you apart. The Lord will hear when I call unto him, stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. The Lord will preserve you. We're looking at Psalm 50, verse 5. Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 5. 5 0. 50, verse 5. And see how to be ready and how to escape. It says in verse 5 Gather my saints together unto me before the calamity comes before the punishment comes gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice isaiah chapter 26 isaiah chapter 26 i read from verse 19 Isaiah 26, verse 20 actually, verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were for a moment, until the indignation be overpassed. He calls his people, the godly ones, the righteous ones, the people of God, those who have made a covenant with him, those who have taken a decision, I am for God and he is for me. He has cleansed my heart. He has saved my soul. I put my trust, my faith, my confidence in him. He says, if you are one of my people, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and then shut thy doors about thee. Hide yourself. As it were for a moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Jeremiah. Chapter 51, Jeremiah chapter 51, and we're reading from verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man a soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, but this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will rain down to her a recompense. That same chapter, look at verse 45. Verse 45, my people, go ye out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. We can escape. We'll escape. I said we will escape. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, through his substitutionary sacrifice, has provided the way of escape and is the only way of escape. There's no other way. We ask and we receive his grace to repent and to believe on him. And we receive the salvation. We abide in him. We grow in him. We believe him to be holy. We believe him to be sanctified. And we remain committed and consecrated unto the Lord. And we cleave unto him. Just for you to remember. How can I summarize what we need to do, everyone? So that by the grace of God, that day of darkness coming, you will escape. I didn't hear your amen. Number one, see him. See him. See him as the only way of escape. Don't turn to any other. There is no salvation in any other. But the name of Jesus, through his sacrifice, and his shed blood, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Number one, see him. Number two, seek him. Seek him above all else on earth. Money will not deliver on that day. Seek him above money. Position, prosperity, wealth, whatever, will not deliver on that day. Seek him above all else. Number three, set him before you. I've set the Lord always before me. Temptation comes, I'm looking at the Lord, the author and the finisher of my faith. And trials come, I search the Lord always before me. And challenges come, set him before you as your perfect example. Number four, satisfy him. Satisfy him. He's looking for people that are set apart for him so that he will honor them. He will exalt them. He will separate them from that day of judgment to come. Satisfy him doing only his pleasure. Number five, show him. Show him. Show him in fullness to the world around you. Carry him to your office. Carry him to your community. Let people know, let heaven know, and let the whole earth know that you love him and you show him to all the people around you in fullness. Number six, serve him. Serve him. Serve him as the one who is coming to take you away before the day of gloominess and darkness. Serve him with all your heart. Serve him with all your soul. Serve him with all your mind. Serve him with all your strength. Serve him with all your substance. Number seven, stand up for him. Stand up for him. The people of the world, not knowing the glory of the Lord, they take his name, they put it in the mud, you will stand up for him you will say that's my lord that's my savior that's my redeemer when they jest when they joke when they blaspheme when they say things they shouldn't say when they compare him with ordinary men that's the time you are to stand up for him before all people stand up for him in all places stand up for him in every of at every opportunity stand up for him at all times good times bad times rainy time rainy season and dry season stand up for him by all means all the energy you have all the consecration you have all the courage you have all the backbone you have you stand up for him and then in all situations and then until your last breath, until your last breath, you will stand for him. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, his soldiers of the cross. 
whatever comes and whatever betides, you will see him. You will seek him. You will set him before you as your perfect example. You will satisfy him. You will show him in fullness to the world. You will serve him with all your strength and heart and soul and mind and, and substance. And you'll stand up for him. Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape. Underline that in your Bible, you will escape. I will escape. We shall escape in Jesus' name. That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're coming back to Second Peter chapter 3. We're coming to point number 3 now. A righteous example for all disciples of the Lord. As we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. I will want to take part when the Lord will come and the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive will be caught away together with them in the clouds. There is an example that we find at the end of 2 Peter chapter 3 and from verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, as written unto you, as also to in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard. To be understood, which they that are learned and unstable rest, the twist, the distort, as they do also all the scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever amen there's something we need to learn here about peter and Paul, about Paul and Peter. You understand, Peter had been a disciple as well as an apostle before Paul was ever converted. Chapters 1 to 8 of Acts of the Apostles, you don't find Paul there. He was still a sinner, an injurious person, a persecutor, he did evil. Chapter 9, he became converted. While Peter had been in the Lord for many years. I want you to notice this about Peter and Paul. Number one, Peter was rebuked by Paul. Peter rebuked by Paul. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, I read from verse 11. Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I, Paul, withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also 
was carried away was there dissimulation. But when I saw that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou be a Jew, leavest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And, and so on. You know the point I'm trying to make? Peter was rebuked by Paul. But you understand when we say somebody is saved and sanctified, he had no animosity, that's Peter. He had no quarrel against Paul. I did wrong. I behaved wrong. That's why Paul rebuked me. I shouldn't look down on him and say, who are you? I've been an apostle before you were born again. When you were still swimming in the ocean of sin, I was already praying for people, healing people. My shadow already healing people. Shut up. You don't have any right to talk to me. Peter was saved and sanctified. And even though Peter was rebuked by Paul, no anger, no fighting back. Number two, Peter respected Paul. Come back to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. And I count that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. He called him brother. He called him a beloved brother. He called him our beloved brother. You can tell in his language, you can tell in his tone that he wasn't taking even, he wasn't, uh, you know, going to get even with Paul. Who oh, is Paul? He didn't have respect for me. Yes, I know I did wrong. How could he talk to me like that? Never. That's what we say. When we're saved and we're sanctified, we keep that same respect we would have had for that man even if there was nothing in between us. Look at Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Peter respected Paul. Number three, Peter recognized Paul. Look at that verse 15 again. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Has written unto you. I want you to see chapter 3 verse 1. Chapter 3 verse 1 of Second Peter this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. I now write unto you. Peter said, I'm writing to you. And then before he finished the epistle, he said, according to the wisdom given unto Paul, he has written unto you. You see, there was no jealousy. Paul, what are you doing? Don't you think I know the truth? Don't you think I have the fullness of the truth? Don't you think Jesus spoke to me and I have a calling? And he said, Lovest thou me more than these? And I said, Yes, Lord, feed my lamb. Why are you writing to the same people I'm writing to? Why are you counseling the same people I am counseling? He said, According to the wisdom 
that is given unto Paul by God as he has reaching to you he recognized Paul number one Peter was rebuked by Paul number two Peter respected Paul number three Peter recognized Paul number four Peter recommended Paul Peter recommended Paul there's some people that will say I won't talk bad about him I won't talk good about him if he has a ministry let him prove himself if he has a calling let him prove himself I know my calling and since I know my calling I will do what God has given me to do I'm not going to recommend anybody but Peter recommended Paul look at verse 16 second Peter chapter 3 verse 16 as also in all his epistles all his epistles no jealousy Peter wrote only two epistles and Paul wrote 14 if you count Hebrews of them and there was no jealousy and he said all his epistles all his epistles the wisdom of God is there all his epistles the revelation of God is there speaking in them of these things in which there are some things hard to be understood that Paul he came after me and came after us and he went to the third heaven and he saw paradise and he saw those angels and he had things that were difficult to even talk about he respected him he recommended him in all his epistles go on reading verse 16 it says there had to be understood some of them which they that are unlearned and unstable rest twist distort as they do also all the scriptures to their own destruction he said nothing wrong with paul nothing wrong with the writings of paul nothing wrong with the epistles of paul in fact he equates the epistles of paul to scripture he said as they do all the scriptures number five peter reproved those misinterpreting paul peter rebuked reproved those misinterpreting paul that's why it says in the latter part which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also all the scriptures unto their own destruction and then number six, Peter re-emphasized the same message as Paul. Peter said, what is it? There are some people in their own uh, individualistic approach. I won't say what he is saying. I won't preach what he is preaching. I want to be original so the people that hear me well, no, I am in every way original. Peter re-emphasized the same message as Paul. Verses 17 and 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness peter was telling the people be steadfast grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory forever and ever amen the word there is steadfastness steadfastness in first corinthians chapter 15 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a meeting from verse 58, the same thing Paul had said, Peter also re-emphasized. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as she know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As we go to our various districts, we emphasize the same thing we're hearing at the center here. In all the states, everywhere, as we are being trained together and we're united together, we re-emphasize the same thing and the work of God will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. I thought you'll say good day. Amen. Number seven. Peter released his trusted sons to Paul. Have you ever thought about that? That Peter released his trusted sons to Paul. Where do you see that? Look at First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 5, verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. What in his time, Silvanus was a worker with Peter, and when he wrote the first epistle of Peter. It was Silvanus that was the pen man. And through him, he sent that epistle to the people. Silvanus, a trusted son to Peter. Look at verse 13. The church that sat Babylon elected together with you, saluted you. So does Marcus, my son. Marcus my son two people there actually peter trained them taught them brought them up sylvanus let's look at first thessalonians chapter one verse one first thessalonians chapter one verse one paul and sylvanus and timotheus unto the church of the thessalonians Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That Silvanus, Paul, released to Paul. Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 11, the apostle Peter said, Marcus, my son. Now look at this, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only look is with me. Take Mark, Marcus, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Peter did not say, uh uh, Paul, don't go that way. That's going too far. I need him to. I trained him for a purpose. So look for another person. You have enough. You have Timothy. You have Titus. You have Epaphroditus. You have Aquila and Priscilla. And you have all those other people. Leave mine alone. Peter released his trusted son to Paul. We're getting ready for the coming of the Lord. All selfishness we throw away from our lives. All self-centeredness we throw away from our lives. And all anger and all bitterness and all unforgiving spirit, he spoke to me that way, he corrected me that way, and he looked down on me that way openly. Can you imagine that Paul spoke to me like that? Peter forgot, you will forget. You respect him. You recognize him and you recommend him. You reprove those who misinterpret him. You re emphasize the same message and you release your trusted workers even to the other districts to work together with that other leader in Jesus' name. 
you will be a favorite of heaven. You will be a special, peculiar minister in heaven. And you will, this work of God will prosper in your hand and in our hands together in Jesus' name. See there that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be, ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? We're waiting for the coming of the Lord. We will not wait in vain. When he comes, he will find you ready. He will find me ready. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that when the Lord shall come, before that great day, that great terrible day of the Lord, He'll find you ready, He'll find me ready, He'll find us ready. Let's help one another, assist one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, respect one another, and intercede for one another, and build one another, so that as your work is prospering, his own will be prospering, our own will be prospering, we'll prosper together, and when the Lord comes, it will be a great, glorious day for you, for me, for us, in Jesus' name.